I'm Doug Ferrer, and this is The World Unpacked. Tensions between Russia and the West are growing rapidly. A Russian military buildup is visible on the ground and from the air. In 2014, yes, President Biden is ramping up the pressure on Vladimir Putin, warning the Russian president of, quote, enormous consequences if he invades Ukraine and taking the rhetoric a step further, issuing a personal threat to Putin. Ukrainian leaders. Russian forces are mobilizing on the Ukrainian border and Vladimir Putin seems determined to invade. American diplomats are exploring all options to broker an agreement between the West and Russia that heads off a war in Europe. The crisis will test the mettle of the most experienced diplomats at the State Department as they balance U.S. national interests, the security of America's European allies, and Russia's determination to keep Ukraine in its sphere of influence. Lucky for us, we have Derek Cholet, the counselor of the U.S. State Department and senior policy advisor to Secretary of State Antony Blinken with us today. We will dive deep on the Ukraine crisis and then touch on other challenges and successes for the Biden administration's foreign policy. Here we go. Councillor Chalet, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. And please call me Derek. Will do. So uh, many of our listeners hope to one day work at the State Department. And so before we dive into Ukraine, I just want to understand, what is your job as counselor at the State Department? Well, first, it, it's great to be with you. And thanks so much for having me here. So uh, what is the counselor of the department? Uh, I can see that uh, like like many, many jobs in government in Washington, it sounds entirely made up, uh, counselor, uh, but actually it has a pretty uh, prestigious pedigree here in the department going back over a century uh, when it was established in statute uh, in the 19, 19 teens. Um, and I'm, I'm very humbled of, of many folks uh, who preceded me in this job from George Kennan to Bob Zellick to our current Deputy Secretary, Wendy Sherman, uh, for Secretary Albright. Um, so uh, in this job, it, it admitted, is a bit of, of course, what the Secretary wants it to be. Uh, and uh, I have had the good fortune of, of been uh, having worked with and been a friend of uh, Secretary Blinken's for almost 20 years, going back to the Clinton administration, so more than 20 years. Uh, and I was part of the State Department transition team over a year ago, and, and in many ways, my job is a continuation of, of that work, uh, starting with him during the transition. Uh, obviously, I work very closely with him and my other senior colleagues here in the department to help uh, steer the ship of, of the State Department and its role in, in U.S. foreign policy, um, and, and obviously serving as, a, as a, an advisor to him. Um, and there's a lot that I do every day that's literally counseling, uh, just, just working with him and other senior folks in this building and elsewhere in the government to work through the issues. Um, but then also uh, there'll be uh, issues that will pop up that uh, we decide there needs to be senior attention put on them uh, either for an extended period or just just to fill a gap uh, here. And I uh, take on take on those roles uh, as well. So I kind of sometimes I'm sort of like in football terms, I'm like a middle linebacker uh, kind of roving the field, uh, uh, looking to solve problems and make people's jobs easier. Um, so um, it's a great privilege to work here every day. And, I, you know, I, I've got great colleagues. And I think one of the things I've learned throughout my career is that uh, uh, your your boss and your colleagues matter much more than, than your job description or title. Uh, and so Secretary Blinken has built a great team and, and here at the department, and I think there's a great foreign policy team here in this administration. Many of us has, have worked together over many years and, and know each other well. And uh, that's those uh, relationships, friendships are, are really needed, particularly when times are are tough and stressful uh, as they have been in abundance over the last year. That's certainly true. And we're fortunate to have a great and experienced uh, team of diplomats in the State Department because right now is an incredibly trying moment in American foreign policy. And foremost among the issues is what's going on with the Russians massing troops on the border with Ukraine. So I want to talk about that. Russia will be held accountable if it invades. And it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a In minor- In President minor Biden's president. press conference last week, he said that the U.S. and NATO would respond depending on the level of incursion or invasion that Russia might undertake with Ukraine. Later, he obviously cleared Clean that, cleared that up, and and Jen Psaki weighed in as well, saying, you know, anything will result in 
a a massive response in the United States. I guess the question I have is, is there a, a, a strong red line that the administration is drawing on Ukraine in terms of what Russia may or may not do? Look, we've made very clear an invasion is an invasion is an invasion. That that if Russia further invades Ukraine, uh, it will uh, suffer great consequences. Um, now, we are also making clear that the door for diplomacy remains open. We, of course, do not seek further confrontation with Russia. Uh, and Secretary Blinken, uh, others uh, in the department here, Wendy Sherman, uh, uh, have been engaging with the Russians over the last several weeks to see if there uh, are things that they might be willing to talk about. Um, they have, they of course, made public uh, some of their demands <laughs> on us, and, and we have been very clear that many of their demands are uh, completely unacceptable and non-starters. I mean, in, a, in essence, what they're trying to do uh, and some of these demands is is unwind the last quarter century of work that we have done to build the security architecture in Europe. And uh, Russia is not going to get uh, a veto over NATO's future. It's not going to dictate that NATO uh, roll back its commitments to to partners that have joined the alliance uh, since the late 1990s. Um, we've made clear that there are some areas that we'd be willing to discuss with them, particularly in the nature of arms control or greater transparency on exercises, things of that nature. Uh, and now we're testing whether that that door to diplomacy will be they will enter in, enter through that. And uh, in the this week, uh, we will be providing Russia with written answers as they've requested to. Some of the questions that they have raised and then we will see where we go from there and whether they are willing to take us up on the offer for further dialogue but at the same time and to, to make clear we have said if they choose the other path if they choose to go through another door a door of greater escalation uh, and confrontation there will be consequences on them and the consequences will be meaningful they will be uh, uh, widely felt, uh, and we think that uh, they will not be in Russia's uh, larger interest. President Biden's done a great job of reinvigorating America's engagement with the world, especially with Europe, obviously, after the Trump administration. That said, you know, Germany's perspective, you know, where they get such a huge percentage of their energy from Russian uh, oil and gas reserves, or France's perspective, or Poland's perspective, are all a bit different on this. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how the State Department working uh, at President Biden's direction has sought to get our allies to present a united front and whether in fact we are really all on the same page. Um, uh, look, countries are gonna have different perspectives, de debates over tactics, uh, uh, sequencing, all of that stuff. But um, I have been struck by the level of, of agreement that we have had uh, with our allies and partners uh, on this issue. And uh, one would hope that's something that Moscow is also seeing, and it would make them think twice about, about escalating further. But look, how you go about it, first, you be as transparent as you can be. And that's why in the early months of, of this crisis, when we were watching things build uh, uh, on, on Ukraine's border and getting increasingly concerned about it, we worked very hard to uh, share as much as possible what we were seeing with our allies and partners and giving them our best perspective on the way forward, uh, there was a diplomacy that 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 really started back in the November, late October, November timeframe uh, with allies and partners on this, and it built throughout the end of the year, and it's obviously intensified quite a bit just in the last several weeks. And so we are having constant communications uh, with our allies and partners at all levels of our department. Obviously, Secretary Blinken, uh, who earlier uh, this week participated in the EU Foreign Affairs Council meeting of, of EU ministers. He was in Europe last week, Wendy Sherman, Toria Newland, our Undersecretary for Political Affairs, uh, Karen Donfried, our Assistant Secretary for Europe, near constant conversation with our European partners. I myself uh, spent the last uh, several days on the phone uh, every day with uh, European uh, allies, um, talking to them about the issues, hearing from them, any concerns they might have giving them uh, uh, our sense of the way forward. So it's that kind of day-to-day -day work. It's not particularly glamorous, but it's that kind of day-to-day -day work, which is absolutely essential to keeping our allies and partners all together. Um, and 
Uh, a lot more of that is going to be required in the days ahead as this crisis continues to evolve. Um, but uh, you know, our sense is is that 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 is what we can control. What we can we ultimately are not going to be able to control the decision Vladimir Putin makes. We can help shape that shape the environment in which he's making that decision and hopefully change his calculations. But this is what he decides to do uh, is something that that there's limits to how we can we can we can govern that. One of the most important players here is Germany, and I'm wondering if you think that they're willing to shelve the Nord Stream 2 pipeline should Russia invade Ukraine or reinvade Ukraine? Uh, look, they have said uh, publicly many times that uh, uh, that if if Russia were to further invade Ukraine, um, and th th it's some version of all options are on the table, uh, and. In my discussions with German colleagues, going back to the discussions with them in the spring and summer, when we were working through uh, a joint statement that uh, makes very clear that if Russia were to uh, further threaten its neighbors and weaponize energy, that there would be uh, severe consequences, including the future of Nord Stream 2, um, that Germany will hold to that. Uh, uh, that's that's my view that they will hold to that but this is this is a constant conversation we're having with them and the expectation we have to stand up to their uh end of the agreement that we forged with them i want to zoom out a little bit to sort of the broader themes and trend lines that led to this point and um yeah i hesitate to ask you to enter the mind of vladimir P putin scary as that may be <laughs> uh, but um but I, I also know that a colleague a former colleague of yours certainly someone i admire very much who thinks about these issues a lot is fiona hill yeah and she she wrote a great piece in the new york times which we'll put in the show notes yeah if you haven't read it the basic thesis is that putin's ultimate goal is to have the united states really withdraw from europe in general um I wonder, I guess, if you if you think that that's accurate, and if you if you think that's even an achievable goal, or is this just sort of the the ravings of a of a long empowered sort of autocrat of Russia? Yeah, well, um, I I mean, look, P Putin has been very consistent over the years, and go back and read a speech that he gave at the Munich Security Conference, I believe, in two thousand and seven. Uh, uh, in which uh, then Secretary of Defense Robert Gates famously responded by saying, you know, one Cold War was enough. Uh, but Putin's goals are, are pretty straightforward and clear. He wants to weaken the European Union. He wants to have a sphere of influence uh, uh, akin to the Soviet Empire. Uh, he wants, and so therefore, to have a control over his, his neighbor's destiny. He wants to weaken or at least weaken, if not entirely break up NATO. Uh, and he wants to divide the U.S. from Europe. So that's those have been his goals for the better part of two decades now. Um, and what what I see happening now is just a just a further manifestation uh, of of his effort to to try to achieve those goals do you think nato expansion was a mistake no and i, I think nato enlargement was one of the great strategic successes of, of the post-cold war period and the, and um I, I think putin finds that a pretty convenient excuse uh to use to to achieve uh, other goals i mean as i said he's he is interested in in doing what he can to weaken nato and and i think he wouldn't he certainly would want to see nato uh go away but um, I don't buy the argument that it's somehow our fault and it's NATO enlargement's fault that we're that Putin is seeking to to use uh, whatever tool he can to uh, uh, determine the destiny of, of Ukraine. I just I just don't buy it. You know, for those of you too young to remember, uh, uh, and I, old guys like me have to remind folks of this. You know, the 1990s NATO enlargement was one of the most contested issues in the foreign policy debate. Uh, and there were many, many, many foreign policy analysts who didn't think it was a good idea. Um, and I think that, uh, as I said, it was one of the one of the great strategic successes because it helps in the goal of, of bringing in uh, Central and Eastern European partners, who, by the way, want, wanted to be part of NATO. They were they were they were allowed to choose their own destiny in terms of 
uh, uh, what what countries they could ally with, and they, uh, in large measure, chose to and very very routine to become part of of the NATO alliance. I'm always struck that these debates, going back to the 90s, even to today, occur as though somehow uh, countries shouldn't get to choose on their own uh, who who they wish to ally with. That doesn't I mean NATO has a quite rigorous process of who can join, obviously, and it's not easy to become a member of NATO. So countries who do become mem NATO members actually really want it. They have to make a lot of hard decisions and sacrifices uh, to be eligible to, to join NATO. Um, and oftentimes I find the Washington debates about NATO enlargement sometimes exist as of these, these countries and, and the people who live in these countries don't map, that they're just merely pawns. Uh, and that always has struck me as a bit odd. One corollary to this is the conversation around the European Europe's own security framework. Yeah. Uh, at points in the previous administration, they talked about strategic autonomy, and there's been some conversations around that. There's been mm -hmm. talk about their contribution to NATO and their defense budgets. Yeah. So I'd be curious your views on those two issues, right? Does Europe need a more robust security framework for the European Union? And I mean, do they need to contribute more to their own defense budgets in the national level? Uh, shorthand, yes and yes. I mean, I I personally, and, and certainly when I was serving at the Pentagon during those years, felt this way, felt that, you know, if I, if you're, we want Europe to be more capable. We want them to be able to project power more on their own, not rely so much on the United States. Uh, and so, obviously, we we want to do, we want them to do so in a way that uh, is is um, aligned with our NATO obligations. And so, like Secretary Albright, uh, who uh, this week, 25 years ago, became Secretary of State used to say that when this debate was was uh, was alive when back when she was secretary of state said we want european europe to be more capable militarily the key is we we don't want uh, any we want to de no decoupling which means it doesn't mean that the us and and europe split apart um, uh, we want you know nato to remain at the core we don't want it to be discriminatory uh, in that we don't want it to privilege european uh, uh, the defense industry, for example, uh, more than U.S. We want it to be a, a level playing field. Uh, and third, we don't want it to be duplicative. And that just makes sense. We need to think about our security collectively. And we don't necessarily need Europe to create, develop certain capabilities uh, that would merely just to be duplicative of what we can offer. Let's zoom back in. Sure. You're an experienced diplomat. You've got three decades of experience working with the Pentagon and State Department. What do you think is a realistic diplomatic off-ramp that could resolve this crisis in the coming days? Well, I think that uh, having a dialogue with Russia over um, its expressed concerns, and we'll see whether these expressed concerns are merely just a, uh, and this is the test of part of work of diplomacy, are there expressed concerns about uh, you know, concerns that NATO is and, and NATO uh, is threatening Russia somehow, which again is it doesn't defies logic given that NATO is a defensive alliance um, and our force deployments are merely to defend NATO partner NATO allies. Um, but if there is a dialogue about and or concerns that that uh, the United States would be placing offensive missiles in 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 certain places, if there are ways that we can try to to de-escalate things. They move their forces uh, uh, back out of the positions that they're in. So this is not uh, uh, trying to do negotiations with a gun pointed at Ukraine's head. It seems to me that there that there is an off ramp. Um, now we have to be realistic. There, there's not much to suggest. Uh, watching this all unfold the last several months, that they're particularly interested in that off ramp, and that's why we have to be vigilant and prepared for the worst. But we, part, part of being a diplomat is, is having hope. Uh, you don't want it to be naive hope, uh, but you, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't get up in the morning and come to work if I didn't think that, that we had a chance. Um, but we have to be very clear eyed about, 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 uh, you know, what we're confronting here and be very prepared for the fact that Russia maybe really doesn't have an interest in the diplomacy and and that uh, they they will choose a course of, of escalation and and confrontation in which as i said it's incumbent upon us to ensure that uh, they will be met with massive consequences 
When we come back, I'll ask Derek to reflect on 2021 and look forward to the U.S. foreign policy opportunities and challenges in the year ahead. Hey, thanks for listening to The World Unpacked. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating and be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's look back at 2021 briefly. You know, what would you say are the most significant achievements uh, of the Biden administration in foreign policy from the last year? Great question. I mean, I think reflecting back, uh, look, every new administration comes into office feeling as though it's been dealt a difficult hand. Uh, and we, we had a lot of work to do in these in these early months. Uh, uh, and, you know, obviously, first and foremost is trying to to get COVID uh, under control. And it is we've all been experiencing it. it you know, it had a practical effect in our day-to-day -day lives. I have to say, you know, coming into the State Department, working, you know, uh, I was working in person pretty much from day one, but many, many of my colleagues were not uh, in dealing with early on the vaccine distribution, which was a huge effort in those early months of, of 2021, trying to get uh, the State Department workforce at home and abroad uh, vaccinated. Um, obviously, we had a, 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 a raging climate crisis. And with a, uh, a very important target in the fall of this year with the, with the meeting uh, in Scotland. Um, so trying to obviously rejoin the Paris Agreement from day one, but, but then put us on a position where at the COP26 meeting, we could try to, to forge a, a stronger global effort to get a climate change. Uh, we had our alliances and partnerships, which were uh, in pretty rough shape almost across the board. Um, and really from day one, uh, even though we weren't able to travel for the first few months of the year, we worked, burned up the phone lines and the, and the, the Zoom lines, uh, engaging with partners, uh, talking about the way forward across a whole variety of issues. We're building relationships, uh, which I think has, is paying dividends now as we are confronting uh, the Russia challenge, for example. Um, and we've we've had almost a year work under our belt to kind of re- rejuvenate and repair some of our uh, core alliance and, uh, alliances and partnerships. Um, obviously, uh, the, I think the domestic agenda was absolutely critical. I mean, that hasn't been a, a obvious main responsibility of us here at the State Department, but um, it is a, it's a truism uh, that, that uh, we're only, can, we only can be strong abroad if we're strong at home. So the work uh, to, um, uh, get infrastructure passed and get the COVID relief bill through was absolutely critical in getting us on the right foot here at home to be able to have an effective foreign policy abroad. And then finally, uh, I should note the, um, the modernization effort here at the State Department that uh, Secretary Blinken has, has embarked upon um, to try to make uh, American diplomacy truly fit for the 21st century. And uh, it's no secret that the State Department itself had been through a pretty rough period uh, in the in previous years. Uh, uh, it wasn't just the, the pandemic. It was a lot of uh, tur turmoil here in the department uh, over the previous few years, a lot of vacancies and senior positions. And so seeking to heal and, and, and re-energize uh, and reform the workforce here and, and empower our diplomats to do the, to do the important jobs that they uh, are set, set out to do has been a key priority of, of Secretary Blinken to make the workforce um, more uh, reflective of America, uh, more diverse in every respect, um, and also to, to build up our expertise and capabilities, particularly in the areas of cybersecurity uh, uh, and digital technologies is, is critical if we're gonna be successful in the 21st century. So I think those that's sort of some, some wave tops of, of year one, but of course we had our fair share of of unexpected and some expected crises that that really occupied a lot of our time from uh, the coup in Myanmar, which uh, uh, was was nearly a year ago, February first of last year. Not one of the things we were expecting uh, during the transition, but from the that to the obviously difficult period in Afghanistan, Iran, uh, uh, the Iranian efforts to undermine our position in the region and attack Americans and our partners in the region through proxies, uh, to uh, obviously the the multi-dimensional challenges of of that emanate from the rise of China. 
uh, to climate change, you name it. It's, it's never a dull moment uh, here at the State Department. Yeah, you all certainly have a full plate. Um, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned about COVID and how it affected your work. I mean, obviously, the, the concept of diplomacy is largely based around interaction with colleagues or peers or even rivals uh, and in various different states around the world and nations. But I mean, you, you know, with COVID, I mean, you said folks were some folks weren't even coming into the office. H how did COVID, especially in the beginning of the administration, affect America's diplomacy? I mean, and, and in a really practical sense, right? I mean, the State Department. Yeah. You know what? Well, yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, so like everyone, we, we the State Department uh, has had to innovate and you know, one thing I think it's important to think to, too, is like the entire world has been going through this. So it's not just something that was afflicting to the U.S. So, you know, everyone else is able to gather in person and meet and travel all the time. And we're the ones not able to. I mean, the fact that everyone is in this together uh, meant that everyone's doing video calls and everyone's uh, uh, having limitations on travel. Some countries are far more restrictive than the United States in terms of uh, uh, gathering in person, traveling, uh, and whatnot. So we had to innovate. Uh, we've early on when we were unable to travel, and, and I would I would argue I would posit that Secretary Blinken, who who took his first trip as secretary, I think in March, um, it was the longest a secretary of state has probably gone in the since the jet age of not traveling. Um, but we did a lot of virtual trips. We, we tried to innovate uh, a, a kind of a concept where just as you would do on a trip, you would meet, you'd meet with government officials, you'd meet with the press, you'd meet with civil society, you'd meet with our embassy. We, we would do all that over the course of a day, but do it just virtually. Um, and, and so Secretary Blinken was unable to you know, get on a plane and travel somewhere in February of last year, but he did do several virtual trips and those worked quite well. Uh, did a lot of bilateral meetings and discussions uh, via Zoom, the way that we're we are talking right now. Um, obviously, the phone still works, so we did a lot of phone calls. Um, so I, you know, th there's no substitute for for getting together in person. I think, uh, but I think we've been able to make good use of of the the virtual world, and I think some of that is is going to uh, endure. I mean, I'm I'm confident of it. That there's there's a lot of interactions that I have in this job. Secretary Blinken has uh, other colleagues that it it's just easier to do it in. Uh, virtually if if a trip's not going to be possible um uh anytime soon and so again it's not, it's not a substitute i would say it's a supplement to to the normal way of doing things let me get you out of here with this last question in your career you've worked closely with james baker richard holbrook strobe talbot hillary clinton warren christopher leon panetta chuck hagel and numerous other legendary american diplomats and policymakers you've had a front row seat so could you tell us a little bit about the qualities or characteristics that these men and women share that made them so good at their jobs? I, I have been truly blessed with uh, remarkable uh, bosses throughout my career. Uh, my first job here in Washington uh, after my internship uh, 30 years ago was working for former Secretary of State James Baker, uh, helping him research and write his memoirs. Um, and then I've gone on to be able to work with other other. Uh, former policymakers helping them to uh, research and write their memoirs, and then in government uh, served with a lot of uh, uh, of our most distinguished uh, policymakers, and, and I've learned a lot from from each of them. Um, I mean, it's hard to to you know. I think <laughs> combined, uh, I've had sort of a, a an incredible uh, apprenticeship in a way, uh, being able to to work alongside so many of these people. I've learned things to do, things not to do at times. Um, I mean, first, and some of this will sound sort of obvious. I mean, all of them uh, work really hard. I mean, they were all uh, prepared very carefully uh, for their meetings. I mean, there's no shame in preparing things. I think one of the things you learn in life, uh, and certainly I've learned, is that, you know, people who get up and do things effortlessly, uh, you know, very rarely, if ever, were they just kind of born that way. They've got to actually put in the work and the time and and study and 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 prepare. And so, 
Uh, you know, I learned early on, I mean, James Baker, one of his mottos is he went by the, the 5P principle, prior preparation prevents poor performance. And he prepared uh, intensively for all sorts of engagements. I prepared for this podcast even, uh, and that there's no shame in that. And in fact, it's the key to success. Um, obviously for all of them, uh, I, I learned the importance of, of building a good team. And um, they, uh, almost everyone that I worked for built a great team. And I was lucky enough to be part of that team and worked with terrific colleagues. Um, and they, they, they knew that, that part of their success, a key part of their success meant surrounding themselves with real talent and people willing to push back, to be smarter than them, uh, to have the energy and dedication to, to help them do their very, very difficult jobs. And as I've um, gone on my career's advanced and I've been able to build teams of my own, I, I, I truly appreciate the importance of having 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 a, a team of not just talent but good people around you to to get the work done, um, and and I I've also learned and it, it part of the benefit of, again being around long enough and being in and out of government so often and and working with people who who were out of you know who had already done their big jobs and and they were writing their memoirs about what they used to be uh, rather than what they were doing now is that you have to live a, a full life and realize that that this is None of these jobs uh, are permanent uh, in the American system. You know, you're, they're, they're not, you're not someone who, uh, you know, ends up being secretary of state for 20 years or anything. Uh, this is, these are fleeting moments. Uh, they're two years, they're four years, they're maybe six years. I mean, the record holder of secretary of state is seven years. Uh, so uh, there will be an end to this. So that sometimes can get you to through the hard times when things are really stressful or you're super tired or you're just really, really, uh, strung out uh, with just all that's going on to realize that it's not forever, but it also means to make the most of it and to, you know, not just, uh, uh, you know, try to get as much done as you can uh, and, and, but, and work really hard, but also to enjoy it and to realize that, that it will come to an end and there, and you will spend time looking back and wishing you still had the other opportunity. You still had that kind of oppor opportunity. So um, you know, I've been really lucky that that uh, for those of my former bosses that, um, uh, you know, I, I stay in close touch with them. Some unfortunately have passed away, but but others uh, are still very much in my life and I rely on them today for their advice and counsel and inspiration. I feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to have you on today, but unfortunately, this podcast has come to an end. But we appreciate you coming on, Derek, and we hope you'll do it again. Great. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening. We want to hear from you, so email us at podcasts at ceip.org. And you can find me on Twitter at Douglas L. Farrer. That's F-A-R-R-A-R. -R -R. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button and leave us a review or a rating. The World Unpacked is produced by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Our audio engineer is Tim Martin, and our executive producers are Cliff Jayapranata and Clarissa Guerrero.